In this video, I'm going to explain everything you need to know if you plan to swap an MP231 for an MP242 on a 1998-2001 Jeep Cherokee. Usually I say 97 to 01, but 97 was a weird year for wiring, so I can't guarantee anything. Most of what I say will probably work for 97, I just don't know for sure. So what am I talking about? Well, the XJ had two transfer case options during these years, the standard and more commonplace NP231, which offers selectable part-time four-wheel drive, and the higher-end NP242, which has all the features of the 231, but with an additional full-time four-wheel drive option. You can identify which transfer case you have by looking at the tag on the back of it, or more easily by looking at the shift lever bezel in the cabin. The NP231 lists rear-wheel drive high for everyday use, four-wheel drive high for loose, slippery road surfaces only, neutral, which disengages the axles from the drivetrain for towing purposes, and four-wheel drive low range for maximum pulling power or steep climbs. The NP231 is rated for 1,800 foot-pounds of torque and is widely considered the best transfer case on offer for the XJ. The NP242, on the other hand, has all the mentioned features of the NP231, but adds an additional full-time four-wheel drive for use in snow or icy environments for the convenience of not having to switch the selector as road conditions change. A set-it-and-forget-it four-wheel drive that functions exactly like all-wheel drive. The NP242 is rated for 1,400 foot-pounds of torque and is more internally complex than the 231. Many cite these reasons to stay away from the 242 because of its center differential design. It is not recommended for Jeeps intended for hard off-roading. So then, why am I doing it? Well, based on my current situation, I feel the NP242 is the best transfer case for my needs. I live in a miserable snowy environment where winter lasts six months, and I never do any extreme off-roading. Do some research, find out if the 242 is right for you, and if you've decided on the swap, we can now continue. You're of course going to need an NP242 transfer case from your year or spline count. For the purposes of this video, I'll be focusing on 98 to 01 applications. However, this swap can easily be done in 1987 to 1997 models as well. However, be aware that different years use different spline counts in the transfer case shafts, so to be safe, find one from your model year or ensure the spline counts are the same. I know for a fact that all NP242s from 1998 to 2001 share the same spline count, so these years are interchangeable. You will need the NP242's unique shift linkage, however the stock linkage kind of sucks, and so literally everyone on the entire internet highly recommends using an aftermarket linkage, for example this one from Azzy Design Works, linked in the description. The NP242 has a different shift pattern than the 231, so you'll need this piece of metal from a donor Jeep. You can try modifying the 231 shift gate, but if you found an NP242, one of these shouldn't be too far behind. You'll also want the plastic cover piece denoting each position, however this is cosmetic and not technically required. The four-wheel drive indicator is a small sensor that illuminates a dashboard light informing you what mode you're in. Because the NP231 is part-time only, there are only two wires for the part-time light, so if you want the full-time light to activate, you'll need at least the pigtail of the NP242's indicator sensor. I'll explain this more in depth later, but the indicator light is entirely optional. It doesn't affect the function at all, it just tells you what mode you're in. Some people would settle for just looking at the position of the lever, but men of at least some professionalism like myself will want a functioning dashboard light. That's it. Although the NP242 is slightly larger than the 231, you won't need different drive shafts, axle gearing, or anything else. Before we get started though, one final warning. Manual transmission equipped XJs. NP242 was never factory mated to a manual transmission, possibly because of the increased torque output of such transmissions potentially overworking it. Also, because of the manual's different wiring harness, I'm not sure it's possible to get the four-wheel drive indicator light to work. That being said though, this will still work behind an AX15 or NV3550, and there are many examples of people doing this with no issue, just know it wasn't intended for this use by original manufacturers. 
So I'm not going to show you how to remove and install a transfer case in this video. There are plenty of other tutorials on that and it's not hard. I am personally going to be installing it with a replacement transmission so the transfer case and transmission will all be going in as one unit. To avoid unnecessarily overcomplicating the video, I'm not going to show how to do all this. A transmission install is in its own video linked in the card or description. There are many videos covering the installation of aftermarket shift linkages, and considering many of them work differently, and I actually don't know how to reinstall the stock linkage, I'm not going to show that either. What I am going to show you is pretty much everything else I've talked about. Let's start with the shifter gate and bezel. You'll have to remove the center console. There are two screws inside the storage box, and one under each shift position bezel. To get this off, first pry off the handle. Then this just lifts up from the left side here. Be careful though, because there is a light inside of it. And then this one, there's two tabs on the top and bottom. You can just pop it out, slide it off the lever as such. There's one screw beneath each of these. I removed the four screws on this thing. I'm gonna take it out just so I can see better. I got the handbrake all the way up. The transfer case is in neutral. And this is also in neutral, so I'm gonna try to finagle this big thing out of here. A little bit more room if I take the heater vent thing out. Ugh. Okay. Oh, and a penny. Now would be an excellent time to replace the center console mount that Ronnie broke. But anyway, our next step is we're going to remove three 8mm bolts. Two of them are under the carpet here. This is the only one you can see. Something I feel like a lot of videos would fail to mention is that those bolts holding the shift gate on either have a little nut or this weird tab stub thing on the back of them. And uh, those will come detached from the, the uh, body and spin with the bolt as you try to loosen it. So, either have somebody else down here with pliers or something, or put vice grips on those oh there we go now there are uh, there are three of them so I got one there there's one behind this thing and then there's one on the back over there but I literally cannot fit my phone up in there so it took me literally a day to get that one out and then this one was actually stubborn enough to break off uh, so that's nice luckily I did happen to grab the extra ones that I took off of the donor Jeep, but that sucks. Get a little bit more access on the back bolt. I cut a small square of carpet out. I don't think it's really going to make a difference because this whole area is covered up by the center console anyway. God, that thing fought to the bitter end. <sighs> I can now confidently declare replacing this metal gate is harder than replacing the entire transfer case. All right, now we can just slide. Oh, no, never mind. We can't do that. We actually have to take the lever off. In order to do that, there is a cotter pin holding this in here. All right, got that. And then I'm gonna relieve tension on the spring and slide it out of this hole right here. All right, I've put the transmission in neutral so we can more easily pivot this to a point where we can slide it 
out. Four low then? Oh, okay, never mind. Doesn't want to do that. There we go. Oh. Alright, and then this just pulls out of there. Finally. Alright, so that pin kept popping out of the pliers and I had to reach down in there to get it with my finger. But as you can see, it's in there now. Here's what everything should look like when it's back together. The spring has a an arc on it that needs to be on the top of this pivot bar. And then, of course, the other end in that hole and then the cotter pin in the back there facing towards the driver's side. Uh, have fun trying to get that in the other way. Now all we got to do is bolt this thingy where it was now if any of these bolts broke off for you i would drill those out and retap them you know like a professional but uh i am so fed up with this metal gate thingy that i don't care anymore so i'm just gonna put the two that didn't break in all right to get these bolts back on tight i had to climb back under there and put a vice grip on the thing again but now it's in there solid it is so solid in fact that when i try to move it the whole entire vehicle moves so even with just two bolts, I don't think it's going anywhere. And even though I still have the 231 in here, for now, I can at least switch between two and four wheel drive. The next step, of course, will be to reinstall the center console, so have fun with that. All right, now for wiring the full-time dashboard light. Everything here on out is optional. The NP231 has two wires on its indicator switch connector, and the NP242 has three. On 97 to 99 models, you need to splice the NP242's connector directly onto the factory harness and run an additional wire from the indicator to the passenger side of the engine bay to the widest connector found here. On the vehicle side, there's a black with white tracer lined up to an empty spot on the harness side. Simply repin your new wire into this slot and the light should work. On 2000 plus models, there's an additional separator connector that mounts to the top of the transfer case. This means you only need to splice the NP242's connector onto the short bit of wire here, and run a third wire to the middle slot on this connector. Alright, so in short, I need to take this 99 indicator switch connector and attach it to the 2001 connector here. Now. How I'm going to do that is I'm going to use a pin from this connector, which is very similar. They're almost identical. They're not quite the same. So unfortunately, this does not fit where I need it to. This is the speedometer connector for 97 and 99 XJs. It was part of the same harness as the indicator switch. So I also have this, it's just extra laying around, I don't need it. So I'm going to take a wire pin out of here and put it in the middle of this one. Now, in order to get this apart, you have to first pry off this little backing piece here. Uh, I already did that and I broke a little tab on it, but since I'm not going to be reusing this, I don't really care about breaking it. Now you're going to look inside of there for the blue and get a screwdriver on the end of it, a tiny screwdriver, and you can push it forward. And as you can see, it's uh, slid out a bit there. Now I'm gonna grab it with small pliers and just yank it out. All right, now our objective is to pry upwards on that little black tab just above the silver part there. I'm not sure how well I'm going to be able to do that on camera. While prying up on that tab, 
I'm going to be pulling the wire out from the back side. There we go, I got it. And once it pops free, you can just pull it out the back here. Ignore the uh, rubber insulator. And now we've got a wire connected to a pin, so we don't have to worry about getting one of these tiny little things. Now I'm going to disassemble this the exact same way, except I'm going to try not to break this one. There we go. Alright. Oh, and as you can see, there's a, uh, a little stopper in here to prevent water and debris from getting in the plug, which is, that's pretty thoughtful of you, Jeep. All right, now we need to get that blue part off. I'm gonna try to stay organized here. So I'm gonna get behind it with a screwdriver, poke it forward, get it the rest of the way out with needle nose pliers. There we go. Of course, trying not to break anything. Since there's no pin in there, we don't need to press anything out. And I can take this pin and I believe it goes this way and then shove it through that tiny hole that looks too small to actually accept it but it's rubber so and then slide it until it clicks into place there and now we have three wires going into our connector so I'm going to put this back in it actually goes this way that can just snap back in like that. All right, now we'll put our wire through the cap here in the middle. And voila, we've got a complete connector. So now we need to replace this connector for the 231 with the uh, connector for the 242. Uh, so I'm going to cut it, but I wouldn't cut it here because I'm going to keep it with my 240 or 231 transfer case. So I'm going to cut them right in the middle so both sides of it have the best scenario. So this thing, like I said, we don't need this anymore. I'm not going to throw it away though. I'm going to Keep it with my old transfer case in, some, in case uh, somebody else wants that. Now I need to strip the ends off of these three wires. They are 18 gauge, I believe. Now we need to connect this connector to this connector. And the wires are mostly color coded. So uh, here we have black with red, black with white, and solid black and on here we have solid black black with red and then our random wire that we ripped off the O2 sensor which is going to go to the black with white on this one so I'm going to start with solid black I'm just going to inspect and make sure that they are both in fact the correct wire and I'm going to use heat shrink connectors because I don't have a soldering iron on hand All right, so black goes to black, and then for these, obviously I'm gonna put one of these on all the wires to connect them. You just take a lighter or more professionally, like a, a hair dryer or a heat gun or something, but I don't feel like getting either of those things out, uh, so I'm just gonna use a lighter and use the heat from the flame to uh, shrink the plastic around the wire. All right, and uh, there we go. You can see it is a solid 
seal. And so I'm gonna repeat that process for all the wires. But now I'm just gonna shove these in this loom here. All right. All right. Let's see if my uh, full-time indicators will work. Nope. <gasps> oh my God. Oh my God. So the part-time one doesn't work, but the full-time one does. Holy shit. Neutral for low. So, something wrong with my part-time circuit. Interesting. After jumping the connector with a paper clip, I determined the four-wheel drive indicator switch itself wasn't working. This is a fairly common problem on XJs, and I actually had to replace the one on my old transfer case. I wish I would have known that before I put the thing under my Jeep, but oh well, a good opportunity to show a simple fix for the dashboard lights. The nut size is one and one eighth, but good luck trying to fit a one and one eighth wrench under there. So I'm gonna use a crescent wrench because it's a lot shorter. I've removed the front drive shaft and detached the four-wheel drive linkage for some more room. It's a good idea to clean the top of the transfer case before taking this out so you don't risk getting any debris inside of it. Although probably not necessary, I put Teflon tape on the new sensor for peace of mind. Screw it on until it's tight, and then plug it back in. <sighs> Please work. Yes! Yes! Oh my god! Yes! <laughs> go, this is going neutral. Let's go. Come on. Okay, it's not going in neutral. Oh, it works. There we go. There's four low. Okay, I skip neutral. Ah, neutral. Okay, there we go. Oh, I needed that. The coup de gras. Right here on the folks. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, come on. I mean, let's go. <laughs> 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 